Hello, everyone. Welcome to this episode of the Ex Umbras podcast. Here, we're talking about how to read a movie and more uh, from the classical education perspective. Uh, with me is Schoolman Fawcett and myself, Scholar McClarney. Here, uh, we are moving along, moving along in our, our breadth of topics. But this one is, I want to say, diffuse. We're, we're going everywhere from talking about the trivium, quadrivium, to the four senses of scripture to oh. movies. Uh, so, so how to read a movie? That's what yeah, that's what, what we're talking about today. Although yeah. we're really any piece of art. So we are educators at the Chester Academy of Saint Isidore, uh, which is a function of the Saint Isidore Learning Center here in uh, Alberta, Canada. So we are the world's only online Chesterton Academy. Uh, Scholar McClarney is the headmaster there, but I help out in a limited capacity too. And uh, today we want to talk a little bit about, um, I think what I was thinking about was really classical education. It's a bit of a buzzword. People yeah. know, who know a little bit about it know what has to do with the trivium, but what does that really mean? Oh, right. Uh, I don't even know what the trivium is. Oh, you have no idea. Well, I'm sure glad we're making this episode so that you okay. and our listeners can be educated. But I do like movies. That's that's great. I, I'm glad um, that would be real tough if it turned out that you had a real like Mennonite approach to cinema. We, okay. said we got halfway through this episode, and it turns out you've never seen a movie in your life. Right, right. No, in point of fact, Dr. McClarney gives PDs to teachers on the Star Wars films, the canonical ones at oh, least. Oh, right, yes. So he knows a little bit about some movies. Uh, yeah. Well, really, uh, the thing about the, tri the trivium, we'll talk about what that is in a moment, but okay. I guess even more broadly before that, people yeah. have this sort of idea that classical education, such as what we offer... Uh, at Chesterton Academy of St. Isidore and on this podcast is about yeah. reading the classics. Right. Isn't it, though? Yes and no. Oh, I mean, yes. And more. It is. Okay. It's yes and more. It's yes plus. Sure, you need to read the classics. But here's the thing about it. It's yeah. interesting. And, and John Henry Newman says this in his uh, Idea of a University. Okay. The, a gentleman is not necessarily a... Uh, in fact, he calls it a cultured man. Of course, man, woman, whatever. Is not necessarily someone who has high culture, right? who's uh -huh. read all the great books that Mortimer Adler compiled. Uh, it, it's more a way of reading. And, and yes, you oh. have to have read the great uh, right. classics okay. to have gotten there, or at least some of them. Yes. But it's more a way of approaching literature, uh -huh. art, uh, cinema, music, as we'll discuss in the future. Uh, the, the, the classics give you a launching pad. They give you okay. a kind of uh, method? You know, a method and also a legend. You know, you've got the map and you have the legend or in the legend. corner that tells you how to... Yeah. Legend in is a pun here. Legend oh. both in the sense of a mythic story and is a code to interpret the map. Oh, uh, the whole map. And we will see puns are actually significant Okay, uh, as part of this grammar. It's part of the multiple senses of, think, of, of words. I think so. Okay. It's part of right. the grammar of the universe. So the a classical classic. education yes. is, yes, you read the classics, you read Homer, you read Dante, as we'll see as a way but but then through that you can look at uh, more popular cinema middle brow literature even pop culture right. you can actually read it in a classical way and be edified by it or at least be protected from it <laughs> in cases where it's not edifying <laughs> i would okay, say i like that i like that okay so, very good so um oh sure where should we start with okay the well, let's start let's start with the one? trivium so okay so Tell us, because we don't even know. We have no what, idea. What we're is starting, a trivium? We're starting from scratch and, uh, here. Okay. Break that up for us. Well, all right. Um, so the classical education movement has tried to recover the trivium in different ways and use it in different ways. But originally, in its simplest form, what it was was that education in the Middle Ages and beginning even in the ancient world had a foundation. If you were going to go to what we would now call like high school, right. middle school, whatever, you had to have studied four things. Okay. Uh, so I beg your pardon. You have to seven right. things. Oh. Three and four. I mean, I'm thinking oh. ahead to our next did episode. We, we skipped math class there, didn't we? Uh, well, we, we are still in the trivium. We didn't have to get into the quadrivium yet, so okay. we're all good there. So uh, before you, I mean, if you went to university, that's where you'd study law or theology or medicine. Uh, and there wasn't a lot of option. Philosophy, yeah, philosophy, medicine, law, and theology were basically your four options for university. Right. But no, everybody, I'm not, what, what I'm getting at is like we got went from three to seven to four. I'm aware so. of that. I am oh, glossing okay. over my inherent mathematical uh, mistake okay. in hopes that All the right. listener has for, mis forgotten about it already, <laughs> okay. too. Um, All right. what, this, is, this is what you do as a teacher sometimes, and you stumble uh, over. The problem with being an talking. online teacher is that you everything's filmed. Oh, right. So all your mistakes are on record forever. Uh, or at least until the singularity destroys all technology. But the the trivium was the first thing you had to learn. And then you okay. learned the quadrivium. And those okay. mean the three ways and the four ways. Oh, the ways. Latin. The okay. four ways. Four, and literally, these are like paths. And where are they leading us to? Ooh, well, ultimately, they're leading us to, well, 
fall in love. Well, they're the liberal arts, first of all. The seven uh, ways are also the seven liberal arts. Yes. So they're, in a sense, leading us to freedom. Uh, the liberal arts were the arts, uh, um, not of a servile man. There's the seven servile arts for that. Uh, the practical mechanical arts, as you would say. And that's an interesting topic in itself. But right. if you were going to be a free man... Which is very, to, that's a very uh, patrician thing to say, is oh. it not? Like kind of looking down our nose at the plebs? I think so. Uh, There's a little bit of mechanical. elitism. I think yeah, so. Yeah. That being said, I think in Christ you can find a way to say... They're both valid, but I guess contemplative life is higher than the active life. Maybe there's still some legitimacy to saying that there's um, there's an internal freedom that comes with the liberal arts. And it's interesting, of course, oh, okay. the labor... I don't, know, I don't know if I'd agree with that, but... Interesting, uh, okay. Well, we, could, we could debate that another time. I think that it would be an interesting discussion well, topic. Well, because, because the incarnation is practical. It's a practical True. art, as, as opposed to being... The Holy Spirit. True, right? but that's but that's not the Father who, who don't become incarnate. Uh, that's true. That's right? true. They, they are above the fray, so to speak. I think I think a good education, really a good modern education, should include the servile and the liberal arts. But that is a topic for another. Right. Day. Sure, Let's sure. just talk about okay. the historical. So, so the three ways. Now, the three yes. ways then were I want to say arithmetic. No, no, no. That's the three ways. Or so the first three, the, the trivium, which starts is kicks it all off. Okay. You have so, to learn these before you learn anything else. Those are all word based. Oh. The quadrivium is number based. Oh, and we'll right. talk more about the quadrivium in our next episode. I skip that. I skip when we that. get to when we get to music, we we'll talk okay. about music in our next episode. The trivium, the three ways there are grammar, logic, and rhetoric. Okay. Then you get to the quadrivium, which are about numbers, and that would be um, arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy. Right. Uh, now. Uh, our friend Marshall McLuhan would say yep. that the quadrivium is actually all an extension of the grammar. Because what is meant by grammar here, and it's interesting, you'll notice there's not literature, there's not history. Those aren't seen as mm. subjects at this point. Right. What they learn first is the grammar. And now that does, in a literal sense, mean the grammar of a language, which was, of course, Latin. But the way you learned it was by parsing poetry, by parsing the histories, so you, so in the course of this, which was foundational to all the other subjects you would ever learn, every other uh, course of inquiry, you had to learn the grammar first, and in the process of that was how you learned uh, these things that we now think of as the humanities. Right. And of course, it, and, and in fact, grammar became a kind of shorthand for all that knowledge, which is why in England, and traditionally a long time ago in Canada, we had grammar schools. Right. right, where you had this kind of elite knowledge that you would learn. That, that's why it was called grammar. Okay, grammar stood in for all of that. So, so grammar then goes beyond learning about parsing verbs and, and conjugations, exactly, and, 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 declensions. and punctuation. I mm -hmm. uh, hear we're thinking about how to speak. Is that not right? Well, that would be so. That's when you actually get to rhetoric, right? Oh, okay. So, in a sense, the 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 trivium grammar is the word as it signifies things in the world. Uh, logic is us kind of then using that to reason about it or to be persuaded or to make draw conclusions from it okay. and rhetoric would be about the communication right? and rhetoric is not seen as a negative thing obviously in this case uh, and then right. and then just to, to as a hint for the future um, arithmetic is about uh, discrete numbers right yeah. whereas geometry is about shapes and then music was about number in motion and astronomy is about shapes in motion Right, so that's that's the kind okay. of parallelism in the quadrivium. So music is numbers in motion. I never thought of music in such a way, but uh, well, that's that's the integration of classical I, education. I, I, I guess there's timing. There's timing. There's... It's very mathematical, right? For something that's seen as kind of being passionate and Dionysian, right? Right. It's actually seen as by the by the ancients and the medievals uh, as being uh, very rational because it's okay. a subset of number. Which now here's the important thing. Even the grammar. I mean, this is let's hone in on this. Yep. It's word as it signifies the thing in the world, right? This is not just about language. This is about the cosmos. As we know, God uh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Logos, which there's a pun there too, or at least a dual meaning. Yeah. Logic, right, and reasoning as well as Word. Okay. This understanding that the whole world comes from Word, which you see in the Stoics as well, right? Uh, the Logos, uh, and, and then right. each of our minds has the Logos uh, Spermacatoia, or how do you That's say right. it? That's yeah, right. Yeah. Wow, I pulled that one out and proud yeah. of myself. Uh, I took Greek grammar once, and it paid off, I suppose, for this episode. But they did, yeah. there's, a, there's a reason behind the universe, and each thing embodies reason itself in its nature. Language has some kind of correspondence to this. Plato talks about it in his di uh, dialogue, uh, Cradleus, right? Okay, yeah. There's a, this um, discussion about, like, the, that there isn't an arbitrariness to language. It's, you know, Plato rejects nominalism before nominalism is even invented, <laughs> is right? right, right. Um, in saying that names have, actually connect to the essence of things in the world. <clears throat> and remember that Plato does look at etymology. 
<clears throat> like Socrates debates what the etymology of Hades could be. They try to okay. find I me mean, beca yeah. because of this idea that so so what grammar ultimately is is understanding how to read the universe. Right, because the words which signify objects connect to their reality, uh, which then has its location within the broader uh, world, the cosmos. Yes, which has its meaning within the mind of God and the plan of God. Uh, so in the eternal right. forms. Okay. Absolutely, yes. Yes. So, right. so in a way you could say what words mean things and things mean something else too. Right. So, okay. So, okay. Yes. so for example... Um, and, and this is captured by artists. Okay. Uh, St. Thomas, uh, I'm sorry, St. Francis of Assisi, right? His Canticle of the Creatures. Uh, Chesterton yeah. talks about this, right? right. Yeah. Why is the sun masculine and the moon is feminine? Oh, okay. Right? Or, or John uh, Milton in Paradise Lost, book three. He describes um, how the sun uh, warms the earth and kind of impregnates the earth in a certain sense. Uh, okay, right? And, and yeah. brings forth, well... Well, like Mother Earth, kind exactly. Of yep. Right, we talk about okay. Mother. Earth. Well, and even Genesis uh, one, right? The Earth brings forth. It's the same Hebrew verb that you see often used for childbearing in the Old Testament, okay. right? So, why we? Why is there this grammar, this language that we use, where mm. Earth is feminine and the Sun is masculine? Ah, so it's not arbitrary, is what you're telling me? Not in, it, no, not entirely. Like, which isn't to say it's immaculate necessarily. It's still obviously okay. a human construction to some extent. Yeah. But it's a human. Um, this goes to the whole epistemology thing of. We have an analogical relationship to reality in our minds, right? Oh, so, explain that to me. What does that mean? Analogical relationship to reality. Well, it's not one. Minds. It's not one to one because our knowledge is limited, right? So we don't have a full comprehension of God or of the universe, okay. right? But it's also not completely disconnected. It's not like the ideas in our minds have nothing at all. It's just univocal. You know, it has nothing to do with the world around us. Right. There's an analogy okay. there. Our, our thoughts have an analogy to the world around us that they're trying to depict. Sort of like. Um, the the uh, icon of the man and woman in, on the bathroom the the, the pictograms there right. they have an analogy to men and women right they have okay. a sign signifying yes. relationship you could say uh, and some legitimate correspondence between them so okay. our poetry and our art and our mythology kind of captures a lot of this that the sun is not this goes you know to what we've discussed before about the angels right the sun is not just the ball of gas it is the ball of gas but it has right. a meaning beyond that it's and not just to us but in the idea of the grammar of the universe, it means something in and of itself. And the stars have a meaning. And the rose okay. has a meaning. I mean, how can uh, Burns say, oh, my love's like a red, red rose? Right. In, w in what sense? Like, his his love has it, thorns sticking out of her? Or his love, you right. know, photosynthesizes sunlight? Well, no, there's some okay. deeper... A rose means something, right? Okay. Uh, as, uh, as Romeo alludes to as well, right? You know? <laughs> Romeo oh, and Juliet, right? Falling with Rosalind? Uh, oh, no, well, first of all, yeah, Rosalind's name has a rose embedded in it. Yeah. And then, of course, with Juliet and Romeo, uh, you know, wherefore art thou Romeo, as Juliet says. Okay. Right? You know, yeah. A rose by any other name would smell as sweet. But there's this kind of discussion about, like, well, what does the rose mean and what's the role of language in relationship to that? Okay. Well, that's the idea that the universe has a ground. I mean, there's even a reason why a red rose means something different than a white rose to us right okay. the redness of the rose kind of evokes a kind of passion right or blood right uh, whereas what, what about white rose what does what does that evoke oh well i think it would depend on the culture in a lot of ways uh, okay. right like why 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 purity, we wear purity, perhaps probably or, yes or, or I mean, a lot of this joy maybe pro yeah, yeah presumably yeah and again there's a certain cultural element to this there is a tradition okay uh, you know uh, different traditions and different cultures have different histories and, and so you do see some divergence in for example what a dragon means in the west as opposed to right. in the east sure okay. uh, but the idea here is that there is what these are ultimately trying to express is a grammar that's in the universe itself and which in the christian tradition the idea is this finds its full fulfillment in the church and in the scriptures so yeah. there's the universal symbols of water right? water can represent uh, it cleansing it can represent oh, yes. rebirth and death um yeah. And a host of other things, sure. right? Like, it's the source of life in a lot of ways. Yeah. In a generic sense. Right. Uh, but there's also, in, in baptism, its full meaning is revealed. And in holy water, its full meaning is revealed. Oh, uh, it's okay. not that holy water is like... In a sense, it's not that holy water is water that's special. Holy water is kind of the default of what water should be. Ah. And after the fall, water got impoverished. Right? Oh, right. Yes. Uh, and, and there is a universal understanding. I, I'm, I'm drawing a bit here on uh, Jean Daniel Lou. Uh, okay. who wrote uh, the Bible and the liturgy, as well as a book um, that distinguished between allegory and typology. 
right. saying that allegory, yes. you know, you could say there are these universal symbols. This would be kind of like a Jungian interpretation, right? Yes. There's these universal symbols that appeal in all, appear in all cultures that have universal yeah. meanings. But in the Christian tradition, they all, all these cultural symbols find their true meaning and uh, revelation in how they're okay. used in Scripture and so, how they're used in Christ. Right? Yeah, this is similar to, uh, like, say, uh, Tolkien's true myth. Uh, mm. or, or Lewis as well falling on that train. Okay, so mm. um, grammar then uh, is, is part of the trivium, uh, it, along with, uh, but you're saying the quadrivium then is a subset, or it emanates from this grammar mm. of the universe where we want to understand mm -hmm. the order of, of um, whether it's the planets or the music, mm -hmm. uh, uh, r rhetoric and um, yes, uh, yeah, so exactly. Right? Yes, according according to Marshall McLuhan, you would say because yeah. because there's a rational meaning in the universe, yeah. uh, that rationality is related to the fact that it's mathematical. All right. Okay. And uh, very Pythagorean uh, yeah. in that sense. Right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. yeah. Um, and of course, the ancient Greeks are uh, the ones to first articulate a lot of this, right? Obviously, yes. like we mentioned, the Stoics uh, and Plato as well. But I mean, really, McLuhan would argue that this is. Uh, a tradition in well, yeah, I mean, encyclopedists too, right? Like so, Saint Isidore, for whom right. we're named, yes, yeah, because he's sort of the unofficial. Pray for us, yes, yeah. absolutely. Pray for us, Saint Isidore of Seville, encyclopedist. Uh, he's the unofficial patron saint of the internet when yep. they're an online school. Uh, but he, you know, he writes, you know, perhaps the first encyclopedia. But when he's defining things like river. He doesn't just say a river is a flowing stream of water. He then quotes a bunch of examples of classical references to it in ancient poetry and in the Bible to say, and then here's sort of what a river means. Like, here's how we understand the nature of a river. So there's that okay. scientific basis to it, and then there's that, uh, and this is where etymology plays a roles full, too. A right? fuller uh, meaning than just beyond what is revealed to our senses. Yes. Okay. And, and which is seen as being its real meaning, not just the meaning that we ascribe to it. And because, of, and be, it, and because it's rooted in reason, which is where we get words, which is also right. why we can think about it in, and, and where shapes come from as well, because shapes are in kind of the mind of God yeah. also, and, and all of this, this is, that's what's going on, that's what a classical education is, it's being trained to read the world as the book of nature, which you have to do through the book of scripture ultimately. Yeah, yeah. But that's ultimately, and the classics do the best job of this. Because the classics best reveal what that meaning is, whether that's the grammar of human nature or the grammar mm. of what, how the world itself works. That, that yeah. you, you start with them as a way of opening up how to read everything else. Uh, and, and so that's why uh, the grammarians love mm -hmm. etymology, because etymology, and, and so did, you know, Tolkien talks about etymology too. He, he cautions against etymological fallacies. But an etymology yeah. shows the whole history of a tradition that's embodied in this one word. It, word. it carries yeah. with it the whole history of the world, in a sense, yeah. right? Be, because that, that led to the origin of it having this particular name. It's like, it's like a database a database of information in every word right. uh, that you can unpack from the history of its etymology. Uh, because again, this is the point of it being, it's not just this universal timeless symbol. Uh, it's, it's specifically because God is active in history. History is the way of him working out his plan, right? So I like to yeah. look at things like, um, we are based in Sherwood Park and the root of oh. Sherwood um, is Shire Wood. Okay. So then first of all, you've got that etymology there. Well, so what's, that, a, what's a Shire? Well, I think you're the Tolkien expert. Really, you <laughs> should be telling us. I mean, first of all, it roots us in the story of Robin Hood, okay, which yes. is a mythological thing in itself. And then yes. Tolkien unpacks the meaning of shires, I think, yes, in yes. his fiction. Which, yeah, yeah. And, they, and there they don't have sheriffs. They have, like, Sheriff of Nottingham. They have the, the mm -hmm. shires. Uh, sure, right, right exactly, so, yes. Uh, and, and, well, and even, well, what is the meaning of police? Well, if you look at the origin of what the word police oh, is, right. or the meaning of sheriff, right? So there's a, so here in our, uh, Short, Short Park is the world's largest hamlet. Um, yes. Here here in Short Park, now there's a meaning, there, there's a depth to our name, and perhaps an indication of what God's calling us to. And that does include puns. Uh, okay. as, as McLuhan points out, the Catholic Church is founded on a pun. Right. Oh, wow. Okay. You are Peter, okay. and on this rock I will build my church. Okay. Right. So even our Lord is a punster who likes to play with words and right. find all the layers of meanings of words. Right? Oh, I sure would like to hear more puns uh, <laughs> if we could. But, I okay. wish I could say I deliberately teed you up for that, but I'm sure I'm sh I have no doubt we'll find more. <laughs> You're sure more. as well? <laughs> There's so many woods here. Okay. Uh, all right, now... It's um, well, the tr and the tree is another wonderful example. I mean, oh, yes. we, can have, we can have episodes about... So even... And this is a case where even 
like, uh, so now we, there's a lot of schlocky fantasy out there, but even the baser forms of it, some of which are very popular, just by virtue of having trees in your piece of art, or rocks in your piece of art, or water in your piece of art, there's a there's a layer you can add yes, to this. Yes, right? yes, and whether we're drawing on um, universal concepts and so forth, like the tree itself mm -hmm. is is as profound as it gets, mm -hmm. is it not? I mean, right. going all the way back to well, Norse mythology, right? There's the world tree, and you know. Uh, yeah, well, I was even thinking of um, obviously not just Tolkien. That's very recent, but uh, the Garden of Eden, right? Uh, so well, that's the and that's the knowledge. definitive interpretation of all right. these myths. Yes, right. Yes, is in the Garden of Eden. So, which is why I think ultimately a classical education needs to be a Catholic education. Okay. Uh, no, no disrespect to our uh, not Catholic classical brethren. But I would argue that it does that. That is where it's probably gets oh, unpacked. Oh, because you know? it, it gives a broader uh, bandwidth, I suppose. Yes, it's to... the it's the you get the the book of scripture to interpret the book of nature, right? Uh, and again, the book of nature doesn't just mean like the trees and the fish and all this with all symbolism attached to them, but like also history. History is part of the book of nature. Yeah, too, right? right, right. So this might be like say, um, Kreef, Peter Kreef's distinction between Plato and Aristotle with Augustine and mm. Aquinas. It's yes. not. It's not that. Um, they were uh, they had a more complete vision mm -hmm. um because they're able to root this within the context of faith mm -hmm. uh which um you know, i think in a, 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 a thomistic view of uh, grace mm -hmm. perfecting nature yes right? yeah, yeah so sure. so uh, yeah it builds on that for um, sure so that yeah. so that leads us then to speaking of augustine yeah. uh, and company so okay so if the bible if the story yeah. in scripture the sacred history is how we interpret the secular history and the book of nature well, how do we interpret that book? Well, uh, helpfully, the church has identified four ways of reading scripture. Would oh, you okay. like to recount those oh, for us? So wait, wait, this has nothing to do with the three ways and four ways of, of the of trivium, school, does it? So I would suggest, so, okay, what McLuhan says is that this is all packed into the grammar. Okay. Right? So before you can, so what it comes to... you have rhetoric? You have, you have grammar, rhetoric, and, and then... Logic. Sorry, yeah, grammar, logic, and rhetoric. Okay, yes. And it's in that order for a reason, because... You've got a reason before you can communicate. So before you can have good homilies, yes. right, good orations and good speeches, you need to have been able to reason about things, right? So in, okay. in a, a powerful speech, I mean, you think of Martin Luther King Jr.'s uh, I yeah. Have a Dream speech. Right. Lots of imagery there from scripture, going yes. to the mountaintop and so forth. Yeah. You know, and, and reason, he reasoned from that, and you can see that in his letter from Birmingham Jail, yeah. his moral reasoning, which he's yeah. learned actually from the tradition of the church in a lot yeah, of ways which, which you wrote on started on good friday but uh, there you have it, it well which, which is like like dante well i mean I like dante that, which we're getting to yeah, dante okay, for I, sure but exactly and then that blossoms forth into the rhetoric that's so powerful which is this i mean it's called a speech although it's really a sermon that he right. gives i yeah. have a dream <laughs> yeah. um now what aquinas is doing it is rhetoric but you'll notice i'm sorry what he's doing is logic right, right? but you will <laughs> notice he's always reasoning from a premise Okay, right, yes. and the premise always come, almost always comes from some kind of quote, and he, and he very seldom says this quote is wrong, even okay. if it's a quote that's yeah. being leveled against him. Like Augustine says this, therefore you're wrong. He'll never yeah. say Augustine is wrong. He'll say, well, what Augustine really means is. Okay. And McLuhan says yeah. that so he's working from a grammar, all right, right, right? Yeah. And McLuhan says Aquinas bridged, uh, how does it, married grammar and logic better than anyone else ever has. Okay. Um, and that's why he's effective, according to McLuhan, who's, who's very influenced by Aquinas. Um, yeah. So this would all be part of grammar. Once you understand the grammar, then you can do the theologizing from it and the sermonizing about it. Okay, I, I, would, I, I, would, I would see things differently. but uh, Interesting. Well, let's, let's delve yeah. into this because um, this is all... Well, okay, let, let's talk about the four meanings, though, because the four okay, meanings, yeah, yeah. again, are part of the grammar sure. in this scheme of understanding things, you know. Yes, but anyhow, the thing I would disagree with is I would root that all in logic. I mean, I mean, he's running with grammar. I mean, this is a side point, but mm. um, because if it's all connected to the logos, I mean, w w which, which ties everything together, it would make sense. But the that... logos is a word. It, well, yeah. Right. So, the, so, the word. Word, so grammar is the basis of it all, right? Uh, okay. Uh, all right. We we discourse about it. Like right. we have to be logical because we're temporal, but uh, the grammar is outside of that. Well, I would say anyhow. Okay, I, I, well, I, I, but why is logic not outside of the time? Because as well? logic is always sequential. It's syllogistic. Uh, okay, and right, I guess right. in a strict sense, mm -hmm. yeah, right, so, right. So that's why the grammar starts with it, and then we have to take the steps of reasoning it out. Right? Okay, so. okay. Um, so logic's not eternal then. 
our logic isn't, and that's where the anal- uh, analogical right. aspect okay. of it comes okay. from. So but right. let's let's before, okay. but before that, that, we that's yes. aside, maybe uh, that's a, that's a, as a footnote to this. Yes. Okay. So you know, verbal footnotes. Yes. Um, all right. So so we're gonna run with the four meet the four senses of scripture. What are the four senses in oh. the Holy Sacred Scripture? Uh, so uh, we're testing me on this now. So we have um, the literal sense, foundational sense. So that's gonna be the first. Um, we're gonna have the. Um, uh, Anagogical sense, yes. which is the moral sense of um, well, those are different. Sorry, 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 sorry. Yes. Mm-hmm. The anagogical is the eschatological That's sense. Right. It's, yes. it's the mm-hmm. ultimate that, are, that pertain to the end times. Mm-hmm. Um, then we have the moral sense, right, mm-hmm. of, of scripture, and then the um, allegorical. So the allegorical, uh, a good example would be the um, uh, Good Samaritan. Uh-huh. Good example, good experience. So for, uh, I, I guess it wouldn't just be patristic, but uh, one way of looking at this allegorically is, um, well, what happens in the sermon, uh, sorry, in, in, in the Good Samaritan? Well, uh, travelers traveling up to Jerusalem is uh, accosted by bandits, uh, is left naked and, and um, half dead uh, in, in the ditch. Uh, who comes along, but uh, well, you have the, the Levite and, and um, priest who pass by, but then who comes along, but this good Samaritan who then uh, bandages up uh, the the invalid, uh, this wounded uh, traveler, pilgrim, uh, brings him to the um, inn and pays for his needs, uh, two coins, uh, whatever it is, mm-hmm. before. Uh, Returning in the end. Yeah. So how might we read this using the four senses of scripture, or at least allegorically, certainly? Well, um, so the first, the literal meaning is what you just said. The, that's that that's, like, that's the story. So, so we yes. have to mm-hmm. establish what's happened. Mm-hmm. Uh, right now, in terms of the um, what what is the allegorical meaning then? What what is it? What's a deeper sense of what's going on here? Well, who is who is the good? Samar- uh, sorry, who is the traveler? Who's the pilgrim? Allegorically, well, I guess it's me. You mm-hmm. and me, mm-hmm. um, everyone since Adam, right, mm-hmm. uh, is, um, is is traveling, uh, right? Or I guess you might say, um, yeah, any case, yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so, uh, and and so we're on a pilgrimage. Where do mm-hmm. we want to go? Well, he's had it. Well, we want, he's well. Ultimately, we want to go to the holy city. Jerusalem. Right? We want to go to Jerusalem. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. Jerusalem above, right? The New Jerusalem. Okay, good. Um, who accosts us? What attacks us? Uh, well, uh, the devil originally, but really having our own lusts and sins ultimately, right? There's a you world flesh and the devil, yeah. There you go. Uh, and so, okay, how does it, what condition are we left in then? Uh, naked. Naked. Right. Adam and Eve are naked. Yeah. And, and they realize we, they're naked after it, they sin. And yeah. we're dead in our sins, mm-hmm. right? Because yes. the wages of sin are death. Mm-hmm. Um, sin kills a soul. Mm-hmm. And, and so, we're helpless, uh, stranded here on the side of the road. What do we need? Well, healing. We healing. Need be, well, and really resurrection, yes. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Being brought back to life. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so who does this other than... Well, it's Christ. Christ, Christ yeah. right. Mm-hmm. So he is the Good Samaritan. Mm-hmm. Um, and where does he bring us to after he's Ooh. healed our wounds? Well, to the church. Exactly. The mm-hmm. inn, right? So this inn then represents... Uh, the church. Mm-hmm. Um, the uh, it, it, now, uh, it can be fun to see how different uh, mm-hmm. church fathers interpret the, the, the two, two points. points yes. So, so is this two father, testaments, the Holy Spirit, or the, yeah, or, or, baptism, yeah, and the Lord's Supper. Right, right. Yeah, so, yeah, so there's sure. different ways it can be read. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, but ultimately, um, what do we do now? Now that we've been healed, what happens mm-hmm. in the interim? Mm-hmm. Well, as, as members of the church, we're ready. We're waiting for His return yes eventually mm-hmm. right yeah. so 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 that's the eschaton uh and that ties into the anagogical uh sense of that passage mm-hmm. uh there's also the moral sense of the passage which is usually interpreted in much different light mm-hmm. uh it's certainly not incorrect yeah, it's, right right mm-hmm. but uh yeah that, i mean the, the, that, that's often how it's what people think of is the message to love your neighbor which is which is what it's posed in response to the question of how to who is how, my neighbor Lord? Uh, yeah, because and, and back it up uh, a question further. It's how am I to be saved? Yes, uh, right. mm, and yeah, so yeah. the answer then morally is what Jesus says at the end: 
go and do likewise, mm. uh, right? So, so that would be the import for our mm. own lives. Mm. Yes. Uh, so, so that gives you kind of a so we, pers- so we, yeah. spectrum. Uh, we can see the the story on a spectrum mm. uh, yes. on this literal uh, mm-hmm. uh, allegorical. Yes. Uh, there's the anagogical and then the moral yeah. sense. So there's a, there's a on the one hand it's a dramatic story in its own right, stands, in a sense stands by itself. It's also a allegory about how Christ saves us in the church. Yep. It's also a moral admonition to us to go and be like the Good Samaritan, yep. and it's also a sort of promise of like here's what it means as we're journeying towards heaven, All right? Like exactly, we, yes. Uh, towards the new, I, we've descended because a man went down to Jericho, right? But he's, yeah, it's like we've descended down, but the, ultimately we want to get to Jerusalem. Yes. Yeah, so, Four senses of scripture. Yeah, it's wonderful when you get the hang of it. I mean, you see it already being used in scripture to interpret the Old Testament. You know, in, in the New Testament, it's used this way, and by Paul in the Book of Hebrews. When you get the hang of it, it really, uh, again, this is this is you read the scriptures and you see new things in the scriptures, and it's a grammar now. This this thing gives you a grammar for reading the whole uh, story of the Bible. Now, yeah. is this just for religion class? No, right. oh, because okay. Dante in his last letter that we have. Uh, it's to a guy named Cangard. Um, he says, my divine comedy needs to be read the same way. Okay. He, he is frank enough to say, there's a literal story about a pilgrim who on Good Friday, yes. gets, yeah. he tries to go up the mountain, but the three animals scare Ooh, him off, right? right? Yes. And then he has to, which is sort of similar to this, right? Yeah. Like being attacked by these things that represent evil and sin. And then, sin in the flesh of the devil, yes. Right, and, it, and then he has, you know, what is almost like a fantasy or science fiction, you know, pilgrim's journey, right? Of descending through these, you know, the, the, the inferno and then traveling up this mountain and flying yeah. with angels through, almost science fiction. Yes, uh, right. So on yeah. one level, there, it, it works as a straightforward story about a guy. You know, yep. about, it's a love story, really, about a guy and, you know, Dante and Beatrice. Yeah. But it also allegorically is about how God has saved us, which is why it's so significant. Right. Well, first of all, we've talked before about the symbolism, uh, the cosmic symbolism, <laughs> right, of the angels and uh, right. and the, and the yes. layers in, in the Paradiso. Uh, and, of course, and he reappropriates a lot of the familiar symbolism from before. So, for example, Mars, right? Mars yeah. is traditionally the god of war yes. it, because it's red and red is blood and blood means yeah. war. And yeah. then he takes that and instead the souls of the martyrs and the crusaders yeah. are present in Mars. Yes. So again, there's a grammar of the universe that's then reinterpreted because you know, it, it's based on the literal scientific fact of Mars being red, even though it's not literally red, but it appears red to us. Yeah. Um, and then there's this meaning there and then there's layers and layers of just traditional meaning that yeah. Dante unpacks through a Christian lens. There's that, there's the allegorical meaning that this is all of us. He descends into hell on Good Friday. He yes. uh, emerges on Easter Sunday and climbs Mount Purgatory, and ta- and the whole thing takes a week. You know, by the yeah. <laughs> by the end of the week, he's in the paradise. This yeah. is a story of Christ redeeming us. There's an allegorical meaning. There's an anagogical meaning, and which is obvious. It's about him getting to heaven, which represents how we want to get to heaven. Yes. And there's the moral meaning, which is that. And this is the thing I think people miss when you look at oh, it's so dour how he's portraying all these people in hell. I, it's, I think it's less about who's in hell and more about what you need to get rid of in yourself. Right. right? Especially as he's going yes. up Mount Purgatory and the seven Ps, you know, for Peccatum, right? Yes, Disappear yes. as he goes up. It's really, I think these are about the sins in himself. And as he goes through the Inferno, he recognizes he needs to kind of get rid of those. And that's what's happening in the Purgatorio. So there's a moral meaning to all of this too. And Dante is bold enough to say, basically, like, my book's a classic and needs to be read this way. Uh, and that's, so that gives you a clue of how uh, any great text, or perhaps uh, any text. I mean, like Joseph yeah. Campbell has the hero's journey and tries right. to universalize this, but I think from a Christian perspective, yeah. you've got to see it as being this call to adventure is really the call from God. And it's a call yeah. towards not finding your bliss, but towards salvation. That's yes, because, yeah, right, because finding your bliss, that would be a very uh, Campbell way of looking at things, because mm-hmm. he, he is Gnostic, essentially, yeah. mm-hmm. uh, in, in his take. Uh, I mean, he's certainly um, open to spiritual uh, interpretation and so forth. That's kind of his thing. But by, by the end of his life, he apparently really, whether he converted back is an open question, but he, he reappreciated Catholicism when he was in the hospital dying. He said there was something unique about Catholicism for the end of your life that no other religion seemed to have. So. Right, yeah. Uh, because here you have, uh, well, it's not finding your bliss. It's 
um, being mm. conformed right. to the image of Christ, the mm-hmm. incarnate Word who descends into this world so that we can ascend mm-hmm. uh, uh, yeah, so. uh, by participation in Him. But mm. uh, okay, so um, so that's that's classical literature. Now yes. I want to expand this to say you can interpret a classic visual art this way as well. A right. visual art. Okay. So, for example, and uh, now I'm hoping that one day here at the uh, Chester Academy of Saint Isidore we'll be able to do a uh, in-house retreat uh, and go to uh, the Marion Center, Edmonton. Uh, behind the altar there is the iconic Rublev icon of the Trinity, perhaps the uh, most definitive icon of all time. The iconic icon. The iconic icon. Yes. 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 Don't don't lay off on those puns. Okay. I'm only, I, 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 I really I, asked for this. Yeah. Okay. With the, uh, with the reference to our Lord making a pun. Now you're, you know, you're really just imitating Christ in so doing. So I guess I've invited this. But um, of course, icons are not meant to just be pictures or art, right? They're supposed to invite the viewer in, right? Mm-hmm. Um, well, well, I believe they're written, not not. Uh, that's the so language that's been adopted. Yes. Yeah, they're they're not because they're words. Uh-huh. There's a grammar to them. Okay. Right. Yeah. So they and they and ultimately they picked the word who is Christ incarnate. So it's not supposed to be just that you look at an icon and you sort of um, think about the imagery in it the way you might for a work of art. Uh, it's supposed to be that it's a window, or really a door, that you mm. enter through and okay. participate in the story, yeah. um, the, which, is, which is what the sacraments are, too, and what yeah. Christian meditation is. Yeah. Right? It's like you make the story, uh, the gospel becomes present to you, and you actually participate in it again. Yeah. In and, and, okay, now speaking of making it present uh, to you, uh, how about, can, can we briefly describe this? image mm-hmm. uh this icon right uh, our, to, to our uh, listeners to our listeners who, who, yes who, uh, probably have seen icons before but they might not mm-hmm. remember which one in particular is this okay well this is helpful because i'm going to say here's here's the literal okay image. So describe it's it also the literal story okay it is a depiction of genesis 18 or at least a scene from genesis 18 genesis yeah. 18 is where three angels appear to uh i think he's still abram at this point he's not changed his name to abraham i don't think yeah uh, right um and uh, he, Abraham hosts them. Abram hosts them. Yeah. Uh, Sarah prepares food for them. So what we see in this image is you see three angels sitting around a table. Okay. Behind yeah. one of these angels is a house. Behind another one of these angels is a tree. Behind another one of these angels is a mountain. And the three of them are sitting around each other in kind of a circular form. And they're all sort of tilting their heads um, in a pious way. Sort of looking at each other, perhaps. And they're all holding staffs. And in the middle of the table is a uh, sort of bowl or plate with some meat in it. And there's an interesting square shape in front of the table. Now, this is literally what happens in Genesis 18, right? It's a lamb, I believe, actually. It's slain to be prepared for the three angel guests. This is before two of them go down to uh, oversee the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Right? Yeah. So that's literally what happened. literally what's going on here. Okay. All of these details are right out of Genesis 18. Yeah. Um, the, the house behind the one angel represents the tent of Abram. Uh, there's a mention of the Oak of Mamre okay. in Genesis 18. Yeah, right? yeah. They, they sat down by the Oak of Mamre and they yeah. ate meat. Yeah. And, and it's sort of, you know, it's Middle East, so yeah. um, or ancient Near East. So there's a deserty looking mountain there. Yes. And the three yeah. angels are sitting around eating this meat. Okay. Cool. That's the literal depiction. It's a story from the Bible. It's an illustration of Genesis. There's your literal meaning. Yeah. And their feet are showing. You can see their feet. You sure can. Um, and they're wearing robes. One one's wearing a very colorful robe. One is wearing a blue robe over a red uh, cloak with a golden strand, and uh, the final one is wearing a rich green uh, and blue. They're all they're all wearing blue. The last one's wearing blue and a very uh, vibrant green robe over that. Yes. Okay. Now, what else is going on here? Well, there is also an allegorical meaning here. These three oh. angels represent the Trinity. Okay. Right. And so, what, how do you know that? Well, let's start from the left here, right? Okay. We've got the angel with whose whose uh, robes are very colorful and vibrant. They contain all these sorts of colors in them. Right? Well, that's understood to be now. Granted, Rublev never wrote a uh, legend right. <laughs> to, to okay. interpret all this, yes. but yeah, um, yeah. we people have sort of observed these, right? The first one is wearing it represents the Father because he's, he's got all these colors. Sort of all creation comes from him. Uh, everything originates with the Father, yeah. which yeah. is a very Eastern thing too. That's okay. the way they understand the Trinity, yeah. right? Um, and behind him is the house. And if you recall, oh. our Lord says in John fourteen, 
in my mm-hmm. father's house ah, are many right. mansions. Mm-hmm. All right. So this is already okay. a depiction of that state of existence and being. Yep. The one in the middle. First of all, he is gesturing with his fingers. He's making kind of a gesture of blessing with his hands. And he's yes. kind of pointing at the meat that's in the middle of the table. Yeah. Well, this already shows you, uh, first of all, this is Eucharistic. The little square in front of the table is much like altars, right. the, where the relic is stored. Yes. Right? Yeah. And the meat there is sort of in a chalice, or maybe in a, um, not a what's it called, a paten. Okay. Right? It's, sort of, it, it's something yeah. liturgical looking about it. Yeah. And, and he's pointing to it with this gesture of blessing, indicating yeah. this is me. Right? It's sort of okay. the, uh, this is my body, right? It's the huggus corpus man. Yeah. And this angel is wearing blue and red. Right. right? There's something heavenly. And again, you could see in each of these cases, the blue could sort of symbolize heaven. Right. right? It's heavenly, but he's also wearing an earthy red, red. like the dust of okay. the earth that we're all made out of. But even in that earthy red, there's a golden stripe. Because yes. even his humanity is royal. Oh, he's, so he's I'm going to guess this is the sun, then. This would be the sun, who just so happens to be in front of, oh, what's that? It's a, it's a tree. Oh, hmm. that's a tree. Okay. Yeah, I wonder why there's a tree behind the... Um, Angel who represents uh, the sun. The Joshua tree. The, the Joshua okay. tree. Sure, it's starting with that. Uh, uh, and ultimately yeah. the tree um, right upon which our Lord hung. Yeah. Right? There's, and then finally you have the third angel. He's wearing green, symbol of life. Mm. The Holy Spirit is the giver of life. And the Holy right. Spirit's the one who leads us through the wilderness. Led Christ through the wilderness. Leads us on our journey through the world. So ah. that's why there's the mountain sort of behind him. Right? Represents okay. the deserts behind him through which he leads us. Right? So there, right, yet, and, and that's, I mean, I'm sure there's even more that I'm forgetting about this. Uh, also, yeah. their feet are sort of sitting on these elevated platforms to show yes. there, right? They, they, so they, and they have wings, and yet they have staffs. So they're above us, they transcend us, and yet they've come among us. Ah, okay. So this is... Well, perhaps their feet showing also demonstrates that. A bit of that, yes. That right? There's a revelation of themselves. They're here, yeah. yes, okay. Um, yeah, that's true. They're, they're, they're much higher above us, but they've still revealed themselves yeah. by the way of their feet. So Very nice. This is going on here. So there's that allegorical meaning. It tells us about the Trinity, about the Incarnation, about the salvation history. There's a moral meaning there's here. There's a moral here. There sure is, because, okay. of course, what does Hebrews do with the story? Oh, um, Entertain strangers for some, you know, entertain strangers unawares. Yes. Right. So there's a moral meaning, just like Abraham was willing to entertain. Entertain angels. Entertaining angels. That's right. Yes. That's right. Yes. Some have entertained angels unaware. Right. Yes. So this is a reminder, yes, to entertain these angels. Right. Um, okay, to entertain yeah. so that's, that's, right? that's a moral meaning. Yeah, I think there's okay. a moral implication okay. for, there, for yes. that. Yeah, okay. Can Which is why it's very fitting yep. that it's at Marion Center, where they bring in people uh, from the streets to sort of feed them, right. uh, both physically feed them and spiritually feed them through, okay. through uh, relationship, yeah. through ministry. Okay. Is there another moral meaning, maybe? Or uh... Uh, I don't know. Can you think of one? I, I'd uh, love to. Yeah, no, there's probably I, many. Uh, it's probably endlessly layered. But there's um, in addition to that allegorical meaning. Yep. Um, then there's finally this anagogical meaning, which is, okay. um, well, first of all, it is Eucharistic, right? Mm. And the and in, in the Eucharist, in participating in the Eucharist, well, first of all, and this is what's interesting. We were discussing this before we started filming. Should we be facing each other like this as oh, we right. film, or should we be turning like so? Yeah. Or should it be both? Well, if you look at the image, yeah. you'll see it's kind of both with them. In one sense, they're right. all looking at each other, and it forms a kind of circle, if you notice. The son's looking at the father, the father yeah. is looking at the son and the spirit, which has a kind of, and of course, the spirit's also looking at the father. So yeah. there's that Trinitarian procession thing. Yes. It yes. creates a circle, but it's a circle that includes us. If you notice, it's, it's a table, it's not, and it's not a round table. It's, it yes. looks like a four-sided table. It does, yeah. So who's sitting at the fourth side? Okay. The viewer is. Ah. Right? You are. It, it's both them you know, in, in the fullness of their perfection, but you're also being invited to sit at table with them. Okay. And, and you're invited in to this company that they're having. Mm. Just like we're invited into the Trinitarian life, which yeah. starts in the Eucharist and finds its ultimate fulfillment in heaven. Right. Uh, which well, is what all yeah. icons really are doing is saying, come and participate in what we're depicting, right? Yes. Our Lady Perpetual Help, right, is looking out and kind of inviting you to come, you know, and so is the sun. His eyes are looking straight. Yeah. At you, you know, or at her. And if maybe if we read this again, maybe in a moral sense then, uh, thinking of the sweep of salvation history, this drama being drawn into this process of theosis or, or divinization, this is the divine life of, 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 of God. Reading, um, what was it, St. Uh, 
St. Gregory, who mentioned uh, you become what you eat uh, mm. in, in, in the Eucharist, right? Mm -hmm. And so here, if you think of the spirit here behind being the wilderness, this is the journey which we find ourselves within, but we're drawn to the tree of life through and this manna from heaven, which nourishes us, mm -hmm. which then, mm -hmm. looking at the icon again, that would be the middle, leading us towards where the Father is, to these, mm. uh, this home, this heavenly homeland, mm. uh, right? So we go from the wilderness uh, into the nourishment of the church uh, through the sacraments, uh, which then draws us finally, uh, is finally realized in in this um, city. It looks kind of city, like urban, right? Yeah, it does uh, actually, that's uh, true, yeah. Uh, reality mm -hmm. above. Yeah, that you could, you could I, I, yeah, that's an interesting point, Dr. McClarty. It's, it's almost like a synecdoche for the whole heavenly city. Now that I look at it, it's almost like yeah, yeah all of the New Jerusalem confined into kind of this one corner to symbolize. So, you, it, it, which is almost you know this icon and all icons uh, and all good pieces of art, you can kind of endlessly unpack yeah, it, right? right? Like course. this in this little uh, house is contained all of the house imagery. I mean, I'm I'm also thinking Eve of a uh, like Rahab, oh. right? It almost I almost look at like that because there's that yeah because there's that second floor to oh, it right saying. it almost looks yes. like that's where the uh right the, the, the rope would come out, out. Yeah, yeah, yeah 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 um anyways yeah so and, and again the reason we're thinking of this is because of the other scriptural imagery that comes to mind that's if, so this one house contains in it all of the city imagery of, of the new jerusalem this one tree contains within it all of the tree symbolism yes, in scripture right, right. This, in yeah. this one piece of meat contains all of the eucharistic symbolism and the sacrificial symbolism in all yeah. of scripture which explains the sacrificial symbolism and the tree symbolism and the city symbolism mm. or the mountain symbolism right, right of all culture and, right. and can't think or help but think of um the table again with that seat open for us but it's in rectangular shape mm. because you mentioned it's like the fourth seat yeah uh, right yeah it's, it's not like it's not a three-sided table where yeah. it's only three people it's a right. four-sided table with three people sitting there facing us but the fact that it's rectangular is reminiscent of an altar so thinking mm -hmm. here of not just the sacrifice of Calvary, but St. Paul's admonition in uh, mm -hmm. Romans 12 to make, we'll become make our living, bodies a, a living sacrifice. sacrifice yeah. right? mm -hmm. So we know it's good and pleasing and perfect uh, to, to God. Right? right, so and that could be, in a sense, we're being invited to come to that altar, almost lay ourselves on that altar. Yes, and that's metanoia, because he says, have the, do not be conformed to this world, but have the, um, uh, right. Uh, so, so it's having the mind, the noose, of Christ, mm -hmm. uh, and, and uh, of course the Trinity, right? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, which, which speaking of, I mean, that's a separate topic, but I also think you need to read Da Vinci's Last Supper this way. Right? Okay. That in a sense you're supposed to, um, I mean, we, people joke about, you know, there's there's <laughs> like, uh, it was a, like there's tw 13 people, but they're all sitting on one side of the table, right? And how kind of silly that would be in real life. But I think, I think that's somewhat intentional. I think it's supposed oh, to be something right. iconic about that. Yeah, I yeah. think because you, the viewer, are expected to be, you're invited to come sit there too and participate in this Eucharistic celebration. Yes. To participate in, and sit, you know, and, and of course your eyes are drawn to Christ's face because it's the vanishing point of the whole mm -hmm. thing, right? Uh, there's a lot of analogies I think you could draw between whether Leonardo da Vinci meant that or not. <laughs> you, yeah. could, you can interpret the Last Supper through this icon, through Rublev's Trinity icon. Yeah, so is that kind of then like the power of the gospel is emanating forth from this art? Uh, in that the gospel, I mean literally Da Vinci is, mm -hmm. is depicting the gospel, right? Mm -hmm. But 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 it's, it's the power of the gospel in that it's this call to metanoia, right? Mm -hmm. It's this call to draw us in to something infinitely more mm -hmm. mysterious and and dynamic and and riveting than anything we've imagined yes i think so it's evangelization right? it, yeah yeah uh i'm just like i mean and this don't have time for this but i mean similar to how uh, a gothic architecture has been described as scholasticism in stone right, right? the way it's built preaches a sermon which is you know why yeah. modern, modernist architecture looks different than <laughs> gothic architecture <laughs> yeah in any event though yeah. so uh, we've yeah. talked about we've talked about dante Yep. We've talked about Rublev. We've talked about Da Vinci. We've talked yep. about scripture. Yep. Now, I want to conclude my end by saying, can you apply this to pop culture? And I'm going to suggest oh. you can see this in something like the Bourne Trilogy. Okay. Now, I need to stress. Now, I've got a friend who loves the novels by Robert Ludlum. I have not read them. I read a little bit of the first one. He thinks yep. that they're literature. I, I don't. No, with a capital L. I don't oh, know if wow. I would go that far. Okay. Um, but my, that's that's my point. And, and the movies were not meant to be a trilogy. 
They, they adapted okay. them one at a time, and they kept changing stuff because yeah. they realized they could make more money. So yeah. it's, a, no it's a cynical, materialistic, yeah. consumerist thing. And yet, in spite of themselves, and whether this is because God was at work without them knowing or because they're just drawing on the universal grammar yeah. of the world, yeah. I think that there is, in fact, you can see this. You can see this Dante-esque journey and the four senses of how to read a movie are actually present in the Bourne trilogy. And I'm talking about the Bourne trilogy... I'm not talking about the last two movies, which are uncanonical. Okay. Um, yes, yes. Uh, and I can't imagine would contradict this anyways. So, here's what happens in these movies. And, I'm, and they're not told in a linear way. You have to watch all three of them to figure out this is what's going on. Okay. okay. It's about a guy named David Webb. David okay. Webb is a Catholic. We see this on his dog tags. Okay. He volunteers himself to the CIA to say, I want to serve wait, my wait, country. Wait, it says he's Catholic? Or is there's that... a detail. They mention, This is the only reference to it in the whole trilogy. Okay. But if you look close at his dog tags, yeah. it mentions that his religion is Catholic. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Now, he volunteers himself to the CIA to say, I want to, be, I want to serve my country. Yeah. So they train him to be a killer for the Ooh. CIA, like an assassin for the CIA. Yes. This involves waterboarding. So you see a lot oh. of him being dunked. Yeah. Then at this laboratory where he's being trained... He's given, he's shown this man who's tied up and has a black mask over his head and is told, will you kill this guy in cold blood for your country? Oh. And he has this moment of moral decision uh -oh. and he chooses to. Wow. He, he executes this guy, not knowing why. And yeah. at that moment, he becomes Jason Bourne. He Ooh. is born again. Oh, right? he has a new, a new name. He's given a whole new name. Yes. Because David Webb has been erased at this point. Okay. And now Jason Bourne is his code name as someone who um, is just basically, uh, he's sicked on people. They just send him to kill people. Yes. Now, what happens then, so this is, we see all this in flashback at the end of the third movie. Okay. At the beginning, uh, prior to the beginning of the first movie, he's sent to assassinate a African despot or some kind of politician. So he goes onto his yacht, yep. but when he's about to kill him, he yes. sees his children, can't right. bring himself to do it. Right. And then he is shot and falls in the water. Oh, so whereas earlier he's able to execute mm -hmm. on command, yes. now he's been commanded, but he hesitates. There's this There's... moral thing happens to him ah. where he can't do it, and he's shot and falls in the water, and when he comes out, he doesn't have a memory of who he is. Yeah. Now, you, you probably are already seeing some symbolism, but bear with me. Let's keep going. Okay. Uh, now, he has to figure out his true identity. He has to learn who, who he mm. truly is. Yes. Uh, and along the way, he meets a woman who's this kind of poor woman yeah. who travels around named uh, Marie. I was, was going to say, I want to say her name's Marie. Her name's Marie, okay. absolutely, okay. Yes. yes. And he falls in love with her and has a relationship with her. Uh, she ends up being killed, actually, <sighs> All right, in the second uh, one. Okay. And he, by the CIA, because they are trying to no. frame him. He's an innocent man who's being framed. And he's able to vindicate his name. Okay. And at one point, he has the guy who framed him at gunpoint. And what? he chooses not to kill him. Oh, he shows mercy. Because Marie would want him to. Ah. He says explicitly. Then in the third film, he goes yeah. back to where he was trained, where he was turned into Jason Bourne. And he gets there with the help of another woman who he's... There's romantic undercurrents, yes. but they never have a relationship. Her name, she's in the first two as well. Her name's Nikki Parsons. Okay. Um, like, is it a Parson? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's where, it's, that's where okay. I'm going. Okay. That's where I'm going. Right. This, right. She works for the CIA. Yeah. Um, and she has some kind of connection to him that we're never probably shown, but we never see them falling in love properly. But there's yeah. a kind of attraction there. But as an institutional figure, she helps him get into some places he wouldn't otherwise get. He's able to go back to the laboratory where he was, became Jason Bourne. He learns his true identity there. Okay. And then so he's come he, full circle. He's come full circle back to the place where he became Jason Bourne. Right. He has he learned you know and now he knows he's really David Webb, the Catholic. Has his gun on the scientist who who trained him and yeah. once again shows him mercy. Oh. But as he's trying to escape, he is once again shot oh. and falls in the water. And the last shot of the movie and it's announced no you know his it seems he was killed but his body was never found and the last shot of his is him swimming away. Oh okay. So. There's a literal story here, but yeah. allegorically, right, yeah. David Webb, and again, all we know about him prior to him being Jason Bourne is that he was Catholic, which means we know that he died and was born again in water. Yes. Right, so the name, and David oh. Webb would be the name he was christened with. Right. Right? That, that's, what we, that's what baptism is, you're christening. Well, right? David, David is a messianic name. Uh, Actually, that's right. true, yeah. So, right? so, yeah, so there's something, he's anointed, he's appointed in some way, right? Yeah. There's a Christliness to that. Yeah. Um, he dies and is born again. When rather than well, what, rather than him dying, he kills. 
He kills an innocent person, and that is a him rejecting that identity as David Webb, as, right. as the Catholic, oh, and I becomes see. Jason Bourne. He's born again. Now he's not a slave of uh, Christ. but born to the sin, death, and the devil, or, or what, what, the CIA right. in this yeah, case. Yes, the but, CIA, the yeah. evil, always the evil figures within the CIA. Oh, right. Because we, we, oh, right, because there's, there's, there's good There are good people agents, in the CIA, of course. right, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. But the system has corrupt influences within it. Oh, right? so there's Maleficent forces, which he comes under their spell Absolutely, now, yes. as Jason Bourne. And is used by them to kill people who aren't actually enemies of the state, but are personal enemies of people within the CIA. Oh, okay. So this evil thing that goes on there. So now, again, when you're baptized, you become a slave of Christ, but now he has become a slave of the CIA or of the evil forces within it. But when he makes a moral choice, and in this right. context, we can see this isn't, this might not just be his conscience, this might be the indelible mark on his soul at baptism. Right. Something comes up from this. And there's like the initial, a visceral, visceral reaction I think almost. So. Yeah. yeah, sort of. So he then dies again, right? He's he's shot and falls in water again, and he loses his memory. He doesn't know who he is. That's the condition that we're in, oh. right? If you think about us, what what is philosophy? Yeah, it's, it's primarily it's, we don't know where we came from anymore, and we're trying to remember it. We're trying to reconstruct oh. it from these memories that we right. have. We have some vague memory of maybe being in a garden once. We yeah. call it Arcadia. Or okay. We call it the primitive communism, right? Yeah. Or we, like yeah. something we have some kind of memory that we try to reconstruct of. Oh, okay, As someone spoke to us once in the right. garden yeah. I'm trying to remember who that what, what was that voice right okay that's jason Ward's situation it's the human situation uh so he has some sort of pre-apprehension of the truth which now he no longer has a vision of it and he's lost in mm -hmm. this morass of life almost adrift at sea literally mm -hmm. uh rescued and and healed by these uh, yes, yeah, that's right. He's Samaritans, patched together. That's uh, right. He's patched these, together by these, these good sailors, Samaritans. Yeah. Yes, on the boat. On a boat. We'll release, yeah. A boat rescues him. It's a boat where he makes the moral choice not to kill. Right. right? Yes. And of course, the, and the, and the boat symbolism in scripture is the church, right? Yeah. And, and then an he's ark, right? It's the, a, it's the an ark, ark, right? Of course. Yeah. There. I mean, even Moses floating down the Nile yeah. in some sense. The and bark the, of Peter. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The new ark, right? The church. Yeah. A lot okay. of that. Yes. And then he. Um, like I said, he, he, he uses the law. This is interesting. He doesn't bring down all of you know the CIA, but he, he exposes evil, and then it's he doesn't go outside of the light. It's it's the system, right, that fixes things. Okay. Right? There's a there's a there's a restoration of justice. Right. Um, but it's it's by him showing mercy uh, a few times. At least three times he shows mercy. Okay. Almost like a you know, Peter in some way, do you love me? <laughs> right. right. Okay. And uh, and then of course he, he goes back to where he uh, died and was born again and does the same thing. He's shot at again falls in the water and it's cleansed. He's David Webb again. Jason Bourne has been killed. Yes. And now there's two women who help him along the way at least, right? Yeah. Who he has a relationship with. Yeah. One is and, and now Balthazar says there's two parts of the church, right? Oh. There's the Marian aspect of the church okay. and the Petrine aspect and of the Petrine. church. And the Petrine, okay. Right. So, so the Marian aspect is the yeah. spiritual, you know, the loving just the disciple whom Jesus loved, yeah. uh, the intense saintliness, the attractive part of the church. Yeah. Then the Petrine side is the kind of uh, he calls okay. it Balthazar calls it the brittle institutional side of the okay. church. Is the Petrine. He's got a big beard and he <laughs> kind of smells bad. And yeah, and, and he's he, uh, cumbersome. Well, yeah. and, and like, uh, well, Balthazar says that's the symbolism of when the two disciples run to the grave, right? Yeah. John gets there first, but he waits for Peter. Yeah, he waits for the authority. He waits so for the authority, authority, right? He, he follows nice. proper channels, right? Yes. So here, the woman who he falls in love with and is intimate with is Marie. Mm -hmm. There's the Marian aspect of this, okay. right? The Virgin Mary. And that's who really transforms him. He doesn't ah. kill because Mary Marie wouldn't want it. Right. And the other girl is named Parsons. And of course, a parson yeah. is clergy. Yeah. Right? Uh, like a pastor. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. And she represents, and she works within the CIA. And he's not as close to her. Yeah. But he needs her. Like, Marie gets her him a certain way. But to finally break oh, in and get his so true identity. So she, she, she's the one who... It's like the attraction of beauty, right? As Balthazar mm. might put it, right? Yes, So right. it's the beauty of the gospel. It's the beauty of mm. this, this truth and love that's there, which attracts him. But then he needs a framework of mm -hmm. which to operate. So the Parsons helps provide that structure. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. To finally get him back to salvation. So yeah. there's the allegorical. I mean, Jason Bourne kind of represents salvation in general. Right. Morally, I think. I mean, you know, these aren't movies where there's a lot of morality. But he, right. in fact, in the second one... He goes back and uh, apologizes to the brother of someone he killed, I want to say, or maybe the sister. Okay. But it's the second to last scene. He goes back and actually does yeah. uh, apologize. He makes, he makes he, amends. He does, pen he makes amends. Yeah. He does penance. Penance. Right. right. Or re restitution in the biblical yeah. language. Right. So there is 
there is a sense in which Jason Bourne is supposed to be a moral figure in a way that you know James Bond typically isn't. Right. Right. Or something okay. Like well, that. you were going to talk about the moral then. Oh, that's that's the um, allegorical. Is there? A well, moral the allegor the allegorical would be you know that he represents our salvation in the way yeah, that Dante yeah. does. The moral is that um, by the end he's making moral choices that we want to imitate. Right. Okay. Um, you know, and he's well, still using mercy. Then uh, mercy. Yeah, yeah, he still uses violence, but it's in self defense. By okay. That point. Right. Yeah. Um, and then finally. Uh, Again, there's that anagogical thing, right? Yeah. He's trying to get back to the source. He's trying to get back to um, where he was, you know, the last time he was David Webb. And he gets there, uh, right? And then okay. he swims away, and we don't see where he goes after that. Yes. That's why I don't want to, you know, I'm, I'm yeah, yeah. extracting sure, the, sure, the sure. sequels from this. But, you know, that's ultimately heaven, right? In some uh, sense, so he's right? pointing us towards, uh, even though we're caught within the morass of this life, mm -hmm. um, if we can become ordered within this framework of, of, of the gospel, then mm -hmm. we, our lives are pointed towards somewhere else. We will be able to swim away somewhere despite being swim all, away. all the wounds that we bear. Absolutely, um, yes. Um, uh, maybe I should revisit. The, the, there was another movie that didn't have Matt Damon, but then they made the most recent Jason Bourne, which I saw, but I don't remember what's in it. Okay. So maybe in that one that does depict him going to heaven, I'm not sure. Okay. But, <laughs> uh, but so, again, I, I, right. again, this only goes so far, obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah of course. But yeah. even this is ennobled if you read it through... Like whether the you know creators consciously thought we should have him die and fall into water and come back, whether they yeah. you know that's that's there. That's part of our you know if you want to be Jungian, our collective unconscious is what yes, water symbolizes. Yes. Yeah. Sure, whatever. But then through Christ, water means something more than it would have otherwise. Has a fuller meaning. Has a fuller meaning. Yes. And yeah. by extension, so do the Bourne movies. Right. right. Uh, and I can't help but wonder. I mean, why would they have named this girl Parsons? Why did they name the girl Marie? Right. right. Why Bourne? Why did they include that little detail that he's Catholic? There was it. Yeah. Was that just arbitrary? Maybe the creators weren't conscious of it. This is like Socrates, yeah. yes, right? Yes, Interviewing yes. all of the poets, right? Yeah, and yeah. they they can't explain their own poetry. Yeah. But so there's a higher wisdom. That's kind that's, of working through them as, okay. as prophets and as oracles and seers. So, right. like I said, if once you've read scripture, once you've read Dante, once you've been in the classics, then you can you can use Jason Bourne in a classical education. Right? Yes, and really, that's how, if you're gonna watch, you know, unless you're somebody who really just doesn't watch any entertainment that's you know not very highbrow, you're gonna have to engage with some of this stuff on some level. Our right. next episode will engage with some pop music. Hopefully, yes. Um, this and this fun. gives you a, a a rubric for that, yeah. right? So that it's edifying to you. It's yeah. not just like, well, I guess I should watch some Netflix so I'm connected to what's going on in culture. But right. you can see, okay, what's point. what's yeah. what's valuable here? And sometimes you'll you'll interpret them and you'll find that there's um, the ultimate meaning of it is, is is false. I mean, maybe it is presenting a false gospel. Yeah, uh, a lot of artists. But then at least you know. Yeah. And well, you can here's here's a rule of thumb I like to use. It's it's the one that Tolkien points out in on fairy stories. He says basically any good story is going to imitate the real story. So the real story is mm, the great right, artist yeah. entering into his artwork. Um, some will, there's, but there's a scale, there's a gradient. Uh, so some, so the closer, the, the better story they are, the closer they imitate that story. And he says, you know what? Some fail altogether. So, so don't expect mm. every story to, to uh, resonate in, uh, with Clarion, mm. uh, Clarion uh, uh, right, right, with, yeah. with, with, with um, the, the gospel, right? Mm. But the ones that succeed, the ones that are good, it'll be even more obvious. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, now I'm a little bit um, attuned to the moral um, aspect here, and I realize uh, I do have to um, carpool, and um, I'm, I'm, I'm retaining some uh, uh, colleagues here uh, uh, so I, I should okay. probably jet but um, and uh, do, sure. do, is there any last points you want to make no I don't think so okay. uh, no I don't think so um, no you know we'll, we'll, we'll go into more in the next episode because that's going to be a direct sequel where we talk about we move from the trivium to the quadrivium and we'll talk about music how yes. to read music uh, can it get any more low brow? But we'll see. We'll, 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 we'll see go, how we'll go. the depths to which we can descend. <laughs> yes. All right, All let's right. conclude. Glory be to the Father, the, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Spirit, as it as was in the beginning, beginning is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. Saint Isidore. Pray, pray for, for us. us. Amen. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.